Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today we're going to be building a brushless DC motor. Roll the intro. Okay, that needs some work. Brushless motors are found all around us these days in cordless power tools, drones and electrically powered vehicles, fans in our computers and appliances, and stepper motors in automation and manufacturing. One thing all of these motors have in common is that they utilize the interaction of one or more permanent magnets with one or more electromagnets to convert electrical energy into motion. Let's have a look at how that happens. You can see here I've mounted the electromagnet which we made in the last video. I've connected one side of the coil to this switch and the other side of that coil to this switch. My power supply over here will be providing 5 volts to the top side of both switches and ground or zero volts to the bottom side of each switch. What that means is when these switches are both down or both up, no current will flow. But if one switch is inverted, then the current will flow in this direction, creating a north magnetic pole here and attracting our south magnet. If I pull this switch up, both sides of the coil are at five volts and no current will flow. If I switch this one down, we now have current flowing in the opposite direction, creating a south pole here, and if I give that a nudge, you can see it's attracting the north side of our magnet. Now, the key to making a functional electric motor is being able to control the state of these switches at the right times, so that our rotor continues in one direction. This process is called commutation, and on old electric motors, this used to be done with carbon brushes which would push against rotating plates in order to select the right circuits at the right time. With a brushless motor, we have to do this commutation ourselves, in this case using these switches, but ultimately using silicon semiconductors, which can switch at a much higher frequency and accuracy. So how do we know when to operate the switches? Let's have a look at how this motor produces the rotational force, known as torque. In the middle, we have our pivot point, the axis of rotation. The green dot marks the magnetic pole that we want to attract, and this circle shows the path along which it will travel. When we turn on the electromagnet, it creates an attraction force, shown here by the green line. If we permit our magnet to rotate, it looks something like this. Not quite the continuous rotation that we were after. Let's reset and look at it a bit slower. When our electromagnet first turns on, the force direction is favourable, but the distance between the magnetic poles results in very little power. If we stop the rotor again at 330 degrees, we can see that the position vector and force vector are perpendicular, which means this is where we can most efficiently turn our directional force into a torsional force. Super exciting stuff. Now, as the rotor reaches top dead centre, our force vector points straight through our axis of rotation. This means that no torque is produced, but rather friction and bending forces are increased. A very unhelpful outcome. As the angular momentum carries our rotor onwards, our electromagnet begins to apply a braking force, which stops the rotor and then begins to pull it backwards. Without commutation, this is as far as our motor is ever going to get. So to do it properly, we need to cut the power before our rotor reaches top dead center, then swap the polarity shortly after. The two like poles repel, then the north and south poles attract, and the cycle continues. Now let's have a look at the power output of our very simple motor design. As the rotor begins to turn, you can see a qualitative analysis of the torque being produced. Do you like my graph? Because I'm loving it. That said, it's actually horribly inefficient. The places where the torque is at zero, if the rotor should stop, the motor will be unable to restart. Let's see what happens if we add another electromagnet directly opposite the first. You can see here that the torque is doubled, but double zero is still zero and the rotor will still get stuck. So let's try offsetting that second electromagnet at 120 degrees. This motor would technically work and not have any stall points, but the output torque is wildly erratic. Let's see how it would look with three electromagnets. You can see here that at any given time, at least two of the magnets are producing close to their optimal torque, 
giving us this very usable output. I think this is what I'm building. Let's get to it. Alright, we're just about ready. First I'm going to number the switches and then we'll figure out what order we need to switch them in. Righto, so we know that for the top of the arc here we don't want this magnet to be on. I'm going to leave that blank for now. We would like a south pole on our second magnet there so that it repels the south pole and attracts the north pole. So that means on the front we will have minus, so three will be negative, and four will be positive. We want to have a north pole here, which means number five will be positive, number six will be negative. Done that the wrong way. Sun of the so state two is going to be from 30 degrees around to 90 degrees. So at this point, we want a north pole here to push that north pole away. So front needs to be positive. So one will be positive, two will be negative. Uh, this magnet, we number two, we would like to have a south pole, which we already had. So we'll keep the state from before. And then this one here we want to be off, so I'll leave that blank. All right, so that's the state of all of our switches in order to complete one rotation of our motor here. Now, before we can test this out, our magnets that we want to be off still need to have a state on those switches, either positive or negative. So to keep the magnet off, I need either both positive and both negative. And in this case, I'm just going to inherit that state from the neighboring switch. So here where we've got a negative on the neighboring switch, we want this magnet to be off. I'm going to have negative on one and two. So we'll just inherit from the neighbor. Positive, positive, negative, negative. Positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, positive. And the reason we do this will become evident very soon. All right, I'm ready to give this a try. I've taken this information and condensed it down to just the switch changes that I need to make between each of these states. So I'll be following this guide, trying to operate the switches, and let's see how it goes. We are in the first state already. Power is on, we want 1 and 6 to go up, 4 and 5 to go down, 2 and 3 to go up, 1 and 6 to go down, 4 and 5 to go up, 2 and 3 to go down. There you go, one rotation. See if we can do it a bit quicker. Now, you may have observed something very handy about this situation. 
I'm switching all of these in pairs. So what we can actually do is connect that wire from this electromagnet to that wire to a single switch. We can join these together to a single switch, join these together to a single switch. Whenever that's high, that's high. Whenever that's low, that's low. So we can actually simplify this down to three switches. Let's give that a try. All right, well that's working about as well as it can, but to run this thing a bit smoother and a bit faster, I think we need to start doing electronic commutation. So let's give it a crack. I didn't film any of the electronic stuff, but I'm using an ESP32 microcontroller to operate three BTS 7960H bridges. This is just the silicon version of what we were already doing, but with precise timing and speed control using my laptop. The speed is meant to be commanded in radians per second, but I didn't calibrate that properly, so it's somewhat an arbitrary number. Power is on. This is one unit. Speed one. Speed two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Speed six. Eight. Ten. Twelve. Fourteen. Sixteen. Eighteen. Twenty. 22 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 Six, thirty seven, thirty eight, thirty nine. There you go, thirty eight. Arbitrary units seems to be the fastest we can get this rotor to go at 5 volts. Now I reshot this with the camera in high speed mode, and you can see here that when we try to drive the rotor slowly, it actually turns too fast, and we're switching the magnets far too late. We will see, however, that at higher speeds the switching is much more accurate. Here we can see the motor doing its highest speed, 1,500 revolutions per minute. 
that's 25 revolutions per second. If we look at it slowly, we can see that it's switching at exactly the right time. At this speed, the rotor's friction from the air and the ball bearing are perfectly matching its acceleration. We can't accelerate it any faster than this, but it's quite happy turning at this speed. In a real-world environment, brushless motors employ sensors to detect the rotor position accurately, and they delay or advance the switching time to ensure smooth and efficient power at any speed. Now, just for funsies, I've 3D printed an alternate rotor to try out. This rotor has eight neodymium magnets embedded along its circumference. I wonder if it will be any smoother or achieve a higher maximum speed. Let's find out. Speed is four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, Twenty. Twenty-two. Twenty-four. Twenty-six. There she is, 117. That's about all the speed I could get out of this rotor before it would stall. Not quite as fast as the bar magnet from test one. I think it could be because the 3D printed rotor has less mass and less moment of inertia. Also, the 3D print has quite a wobble, which would increase friction significantly. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed making it. See you in the next one.